All right, it's the last chapter of the book of the Kings, the first and second Kings. We went through both of them as the last week, kind of wrapping things up. You remember from last week we saw Jehoiakim was, was ruling, and, and basically that was the first uh, captivity when Nebuchadnezzar came in. They, they had besieged the city for years. And um, after Jehoiakim died, Jehoiakim became king, and after three months, they, they gave up, and Nebuchadnezzar came in, and they already plundered the house of the Lord. They took all the vessels of gold and silver and things like that, and they carried away captive the, you know, the mighty men and basically a lot of the noblemen, the rich people, people who were, who were wealthy, and basically took people out of Jerusalem and, and just kind of did a, a, a pretty significant captivity. I mean, it carrying them away. And what we see here in chapter 25 is how stiff-necked these people really are. Because you should, you know, after just being defeated, being besieged, suffering famine, so, you know, going through everything that they were going through, and then just being completely destroyed. I mean, it, they're, they're, they came in and did whatever they wanted to. They took people captive. They're taking their riches. They went to the treasure house of the Lord and the king's house and just took what they wanted and went back to Babylon. And they had defeated them. And they're still, you know, then they set up a king. And they're still trying to keep, you know, some semblance of the city and everything else going on. They didn't destroy it. But they went in there and it was clear that they had the rule. And then what happens? We get Zedekiah in charge and he begins to resist. He begins to rebel again against the king of Babylon. And not only you could say, yeah, you know, but when you have an oppressive, you know, world regime, why shouldn't they rebel? Well, because the word of the Lord said not to. By the prophets, by Jeremiah, by many people, and we're going to see that in this chapter as well, he just kept on coming and telling them, you know, just allow this to happen. Look, judgment is coming. And if you want it to go well with you, then let it be. Don't resist. Don't fight. This is of the Lord. If you're going to fight against them, it's basically like you're fighting against God. And we're going to see a little bit later, we're going to turn to some uh, passages in Jeremiah and look at some of those scriptures where, where Jeremiah is speaking in the word of the Lord and just telling them not to, not to fight. But we just see that they just don't care that they're just really stiff-necked. I mean, this is literally, they've gone practically to the point of Pharaoh did in Egypt. When you read about how, how all the plagues were coming down, when, when Moses and Aaron were saying, you know, let my people go, and, and they're trying to, to get, a, get Pharaoh to let them just to go off and to worship the Lord, and he just wouldn't let them do it, and there's plague after plague after plague after plague, and Pharaoh's heart's hard, and Pharaoh's heart's hard. That's literally, like, we see the same thing happening in Judah and in Israel. And we don't get as clear of a picture, but we've, we've done this in, in a, a week or two ago, and we're going to do a little bit more tonight as well, where we see it's not just the, the rulers or the kings or the people who are in charge. And we just read a few weeks ago of Josiah, who is a great king, great man of God, you know, really try and inspire the people, get everyone back to worshiping the Lord and stuff. Yeah, Josiah was great, but you know what? The people were still wicked. The people didn't fully turn to God with all of their heart. The Bible says they turn feignedly. So they were just kind of faking it, just going along with the king, but they didn't truly turn in their heart, which is why then you still get all these wicked kings after him and you still get um, this, this nobody is, is giving up. You know, they're being stiff-necked to the end. And they, they basically have turned themselves reprobate as a nation and just become rejected as a nation. But let's jump into this chapter here. I want you also to keep a bookmark, if you can, before we, we get too far, in 2 Chronicles 36. 2 Chronicles 36 is a parallel passage to 2 Kings 25. It's the last chapter in the book of 2 Chronicles, just as this is the last chapter in the book of 2 Kings. Shouldn't be too hard to find. So just keep a bookmarker there. We'll go back and forth. And then we're also going to be hitting up Jeremiah a little bit. So just to kind of get you a little bit prepared as we dig into this. Look at verse number 1 here in 2 Kings chapter 25. The Bible says, and it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, in the tenth day of the month, that Nebu and this is the, the, the reign of, king Nebu of uh, Zedekiah, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came, he and all his host, against Jerusalem and pitched against it, and they built forts against it round about. 
and the city was besieged unto the 11th year of King Zedekiah. So basically, Zedekiah only reigned for 11 years. And the siege lasted until the 11th year of King Zedekiah because that's when they, they finally, the siege um, worked for the Babylonians and they, they finally surrendered. But in the previous chapter, in chapter 24, it talks about Zedekiah rebelling against the king of Babylon. So he was rebelling basically for probably about nine years, almost, I would assume, pretty close after he came into, into charge. But you got to remember, I mean, the Babylonian army, they're, they're a worldwide empire, and they're, they're, they've been going and fighting various battles. They can't be everywhere at once. So they had just defeated Jerusalem. You know, they ransacked it. They figured, okay, we don't have anything here. They moved on to their next target. So the fact that they were, you know, able to rebel for nine years, they did, that's just when it, it took them time to come back around again to finally just squash them. And that's what they do. We're going to see that in chapter 25 here, that that's when they tear the walls down. That's when they burn the king's houses and the house of the Lord and, and just completely raise and destroy essentially the whole city and, and just bring it down to nothing because they're like, you know, you should have listened to us the first time. You know, we came in, we defeated you, but you, you, you had to rebel. You just, had, you just couldn't let it go and they had to come back and destroy him. So He's rebelling for probably about nine years before they come back around. They come back, they besiege the city, they encompass the city all the way around about. And then it says in verse 3, And on the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine prevailed in the city, and there was no bread for the people in the land. So about a year and a half. And the city was broken up, and all the men of war fled by night by the way of the gate between two walls, which is by the king's garden. Now the Chaldees were against the city round about, and the king went the way toward the plain. So basically they try to flee. Right? They just, and, and they still, notice, they still don't surrender. It's like, they're surrounded all the way around. They're defeated. They're, and they still try to just run away. They try to get away. It's like, you're not going anywhere. And of course, they caught him. Verse number five, And the army of the Chaldees pursued after the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho, and all his army were scattered from him. So they took the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon, to Riblah, and they gave judgment upon him. And look at what they do to him. This is their judgment. They slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes and put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him with fetters of brass and carried him to Babylon. That's a pretty serious judgment. So basically he watched his own children get killed and that's like the last thing he sees before they pluck out his eyes. So he's got that, that image burned in his mind of just watching his children being put to death. And um, they weren't, <laughs> that shows you they weren't playing around. You know, that shows, you know, Babylon just say, okay, we're done. We're done with this. And um, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. That's just what they did. I mean, that's, that's a very serious uh, situation. But I think Zedekiah ended up reaping what he sowed because he had chance after chance after chance after chance to hear the word of the Lord. And he could have listened. And, it's, and, and, and we're gonna see, I'm going to show you that tonight, how much he had, he's seen and heard. And he still didn't listen. So, you know, it's, it's hard to feel sorry for the guy when it's like, well, you've had opportunity after opportunity. And God even saying that, like, he'll go easier on you if you just would listen. Even at this point, even this far along in the game, in the captivity, after God already pronounced judgment stuff, he's still offering to go a little bit easier. The, the, it's still there. And they refuse. Look at uh, 2 Chronicles 36. Verse number 11, so keep your place here, of course, we'll be coming back to 2 Kings 25. 2 Chronicles 36, verse 11, the Bible says, Zedekiah was one and twenty years old when he began to reign and reigned eleven years in Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord his God and humbled not himself before Jeremiah the prophet speaking from the mouth of the Lord. Jeremiah was literally giving him God's word, but he didn't humble himself. Remember, Josiah humbled himself. He wanted to seek the Lord. He was getting rid of the high places, getting rid of the idols, getting Baal out of the land. And then they find that, you know, they dust off the Bible and, they, and they're like, wow, look what we found in the house of the Lord. He heard the word of the Lord and he humbled himself. He's like, wow, our fathers have done wickedly. This is worse than I thought. What do we need to do? And he tried to, he got right with God. Zedekiah, on the other hand, he's got someone like Jeremiah. I mean, imagine being around to hear Jeremiah preach. In the flesh. I mean, how awesome would that be? We look at these great men of God who, who, who made stands in the Bible. And it's like, 
Jeremiah is a huge book of the Bible. And just to be around and listen, just hear the preaching of Jeremiah, wow. You're like, that would be awesome, but it wasn't that awesome to Zedekiah. He didn't care at all. And you know what? People are the same way today. You can hear a lot of awesome preaching. Why? Because we still have the words of Jeremiah. We have the words that he spake in his sermons right here. We have his preaching. And we have the word of the Lord. And you know what people do today? Oh, the Old Testament. They don't want to hear anything from it. But it's powerful. Look at, turn if you would to Jeremiah 21. We're going to look at a few different places here because the claim is made. It says that Zedekiah humbled not himself before Jeremiah the prophet, speaking from the mouth of the Lord. So we're going to turn to a few places in Jeremiah where Jeremiah was literally speaking to Zedekiah the king. Jeremiah, this preacher of the Lord, had access to the king, was able to preach to the king, and the king still just refused. And he had multiple times. There's even one time, and I don't think it's in my notes, where, you know, Jeremiah, and, and this isn't a whole story on Jeremiah tonight, but Jeremiah gets thrown into prison and Zedekiah comes to him and saying, hey, do you have any word from the Lord? Like he's still asking him and it's like, why are you even bothering to ask? You don't listen to a word that he says anyways. And Jeremiah's like, yes, there's a word from the Lord. Just, just give up. Stop fighting. And he couldn't do it. And he was more worried about the people, about what they were going to say. Oh, what did you guys talk about? And he was going to get in trouble because they're, you know, are you listening to Jeremiah? Don't listen to that guy. That guy is crazy. That guy is against Israel. Don't listen to him. He's an anti-Zionist. <laughs> Jeremiah 21, look at verse number three. Here's one of the things, one of the places where we see Jeremiah preaching unto Zedekiah. Then said Jeremiah unto them, thus shall you say to Zedekiah, thus saith the Lord God of Israel. And look, that's what matters anyways. This isn't Jeremiah that matters. It's the word of the Lord. And he's speaking in the word of the Lord. What, another thing we have to remember, though, we're, I, I think I kept this in my notes, but during this time, there were a lot of false prophets. There was a lot of people claiming to have a word from the Lord and saying how great everything was going to be. <coughs> but obviously they were lying. Just because someone says, I'm speaking in the word of the Lord, doesn't make it so. Joseph Smith right? Muhammad, anyone who, who claims to be speaking in the word of the Lord doesn't make it so. And there were many people at this time that were. But Jeremiah obviously was. Jeremiah's words came to pass exactly. And, you know, people say, well, why, how could you believe the Bible, you know, and all sorts of stuff. Well, there's many places where, the, where there's prophecies that are fulfilled, prophecies that were fulfilled. People, you know, Jeremiah made these predictions and these prophecies well before anyone even he started preaching in Josiah's day he was getting the words of the Lord about about them being taken captive before things even got bad before Babylon was even taken over the world it was established and it came to pass because it is God's word and that's how you know the difference when you have a prophet that that speaks a word and it comes to pass it's from the Lord look at um so let's keep reading here. Verse number four. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I will turn back the weapons of war that are in your hands, wherewith ye fight against the king of Babylon and against the Chaldeans, which besiege you without the walls. And I will assemble them into the midst of this city. And I myself will fight against you with an outstretched hand and with a strong arm, even in anger and in fury and in great wrath. And I will smite the inhabitants of this city, both man and beast, they shall die of a great pestilence. And afterwards, saith the Lord, I will deliver Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his servants, and the people, and such as are left in this city, from the pestilence, from the sword, and from the famine, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, <coughs> and into the hand of their enemies, and into the hand of those that seek their life. And he shall smite them with the edge of the sword. He shall not spare them, neither have pity nor have mercy. And he's giving them this warning so that he can repent, so that he can change. He's saying, this is what's going to happen. And he didn't listen to him. Turn if you go to Jeremiah 27, verse 12. But what's interesting in that, he says, I myself will fight against you. God is literally going to be fighting against you. Don't think that, you're, that your resistance is going to go anywhere, first of all, against the, the king of Babylon. But even if you were to defeat, and we're gonna, I, I think that's, that might be in this next one, even if you were to defeat all of the soldiers and there's nothing left of them, he's saying you'll still lose. Why? Because you're fighting against the Lord. Because you're not listening to God. 
And we need to keep, you, you may not have to face a physical battle ever in your life, but there's a, a lot of spiritual battles that you will face. Make sure you're on the right side. Make sure you're not fighting against the Lord in your decisions because you won't win. It's going to be a futile fight. There is no hope if you're going to fight against what Scripture says. If there's something that rubs you the wrong way, oh, I don't like what the Bible says here, I don't like what that says, you can fight it all you want, but you're going to keep fighting and fighting and fighting and you're never going to win. And you're just going to be miserable. And things will just continue to get worse and worse and worse in your life. Jeremiah 27, look at verse number 12. Here's another time, another instance, another record of Jeremiah preaching to Zedekiah. I spake also to Zedekiah, king of Judah, according to all these words, saying, bring your necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him and his people and live. You know why he's trying to do that? Because they need to be humble. God wants this people humiliated. He wants them humbled so that they can turn back to him. And he keeps giving them these opportunities to say, you can humble yourselves and serve Babylon. Yeah, they're a wicked nation. God knows that. But God also lifted them up to come and judge Israel and Judah. And their problem was that they were lifted up with pride and they went after all these, these, these strange gods and God's still trying to draw them back. And he's saying, you know what? Humble yourselves. And they won't do it. Verse number 13, why will you die? Thou and thy people by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence, as the Lord hath spoken against the nation that will not serve the king of Babylon. He said, you know, why, why are you just going to just kill yourselves? Why do you want to die? Why do you have a death wish? It's just it, it, pleading and entreating the king. Therefore, hearken not unto the words of the prophets that speak unto you, saying, you shall not serve the king of Babylon, for they prophesy a lie unto you. For I have not sent them, saith the Lord, yet they prophesy a lie in my name that I might drive you out and that you might perish, ye and the prophets that prophesy unto you. Also I spake to the priests and to all this people, saying, Thus saith the Lord. So that was, that was unto Zedekiah. Now he's, he's speaking to the priests and the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hearken not to the words of your prophets that prophesy unto you, saying, Behold, the vessels of the Lord's house shall now shortly be brought again from Babylon. For they prophesy a lie unto you. See, they're trying to say that, oh yeah, they came in, they stole all this stuff, but you know what? It's coming back. We're going to make Judah great again. We're going to get all that stuff back from Babylon and we're going to set it back up again and everything is going to be wonderful. We don't have to turn our hearts back to God. We've got Zedekiah to, to go in and, and he's the people's man and and we're going to go back and we're, and, and we're going to get all of our stuff back. Now without turning the Lord, it ain't going to happen. In fact, the exact opposite ends up happening. Instead of just taking the, the most valuable stuff, the most valuable treasures, they end up coming in and taking everything. I mean, even the brass, right? So the brass is not nearly as highly valued as the gold and the silver. And the first time they came in, they just left that. They're like, whatever, you know, we're going we're gonna to take what we get quickly. We're going to get out of here. We've got other stuff to do. But when they just rebelled and hardened, they said, you know, okay, now we're going to take everything. We're going to come back and we're going to take it all. And the brass, the Bible says, is without measure. I mean, you couldn't even weigh how much brass there was. We're just taking it all. Can't leave you with anything good. And, and it's because of their attitude. Let's keep reading here in Jeremiah 27, verse number... Uh, 17, hearken not unto them, serve the king of Babylon and live. Wherefore should this city be laid waste? But if they be prophets and if the word of the Lord be with them, let them now make intercession to the Lord of hosts that the vessels which are left in the house of the Lord and in the house of the king of Judah and at Jerusalem go not to Babylon. For thus saith the Lord of hosts concerning the pillars and concerning the sea and concerning the bases and concerning the residue of the vessels that remain in this city, which Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon took not, when he carried away captive Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah from Jerusalem to Babylon, and all the nobles of Judah and Jerusalem. Yea, thus saith the Lord of hosts. And notice, this is in the time frame we're in right now in 2 Kings 25, because this has already happened. Yet they still have their prophets, their false prophets, saying, no, we're going to get this stuff back. And he's saying, no, you know what's really going to happen now? You're prophesying that this stuff's coming back? The exact opposite's going to happen. He's taking it all away. 
It's going to go in the, in the totally opposite direction. Verse 21, Yea, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, concerning the vessels that remain in the house of the Lord and in the house of the king of Judah and of Jerusalem, they shall be carried to Babylon, and there shall they be until the day that I visit them, saith the Lord. Then will I bring them up and restore them to this place. So there's still that hope and that promise of, of things being restored, which we know happens in the day of um, Nehemiah and Ezra, right? And they go back and they rebuild the Jerusalem and they rebuild the temple and it does end up coming back. But even in Jeremiah pronounces that the 70 years needs to be fulfilled and need, that they, they need to be judged. And all of these events, I mean, they're, they're, they're small events, but just how awesome is that? Don't forget, these things are being spoken before the events actually happen. You know, they're not going back and rewriting this history. Le Jeremiah is literally like preaching these things. And they're being recorded years before the events actually take place. Amen. And they happen exactly the way that they're said every single time. It's not like, well, it's kind of the same. Like you see the Nostradamus, right? And they have this so super vague prophecies and people are like, oh yeah, it's kind of like this and that. You know, it's like, no, that's not how, the, that's not how God works. God gets, God gets so explicit and we saw this already that he'll, he'll even name the name of the king, Josiah by name. 400 years prior, Josiah by name is going to come and destroy and burn the bones on, on this altar. Back when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, was erecting the, the, the first wicked altars in, in Bethel, in Dan. And the man of God came and pronounced, no, there's going to be a king and his name's going to be um, Josiah. That's exactly what happened. Turn, if you would, back to 2 Chronicles. Let's go back to 2 Chronicles 36. So the way, especially if you're visiting tonight, the way that I like going through these, especially when we have parallel passages, I try to keep everything in chronological order. So when we're going through 2 Kings 25 and then we're looking at 2 Chronicles 36, these events are still happening before we get into kind of the rest of 2 Kings 25. Um, and Jeremiah is thrown in there for extra. Even, but these all take place in the same time frames. Uh, verse number 13, 2 Chronicles 36, and he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar. So... We, we had stopped reading verse 12 when it said that he humbled not himself before Jeremiah the prophet, speaking from the mouth of the Lord. So he didn't humble himself for God. And he also didn't um, humble himself before Nebuchadnezzar either. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear by God. But he stiffened his neck and hardened his heart from turning unto the Lord God of Israel. He even made him swear an oath to God. And obviously that meant nothing to him because he just went back on his word and turned around and, and rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 14, Moreover, all the, chief, all the chief priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. So it wasn't just the king. Don't think that all these things happened just for one wicked king. The people were wicked too. And you see that all throughout the preaching of Jeremiah and other prophets during this time as well, that they were preaching not just to one ruler, it's not just one king, it's the, it's the people at large that were really wicked. Verse 15, And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up betimes and sending, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. God still has compassion. And, you know, especially those of you who've been listening in and coming here and, and hearing these, you know, all of the stuff that's been going on, especially when Manasseh was king and the innocent blood's being shed and all the false gods are erected, you know, all, the, all the wickedness that's going on and these people have done so wickedly, yet God has compassion. Even to this point, he's still sending his preachers. He said, he's sending them betimes, rising up early and sending them out and still just trying to get through to them. God is a loving God. Amen. Even when people think that his message is not very loving. Oh, how could you be telling us to give up to this wicked king of Babylon? Do it and live. Obey. Listen to me. Hear my voice. Over and over and over again, God sends warnings. So when destruction comes, it's not God's fault at all for people not choosing the Lord. And look, and look at their attitude. And this is, 
I just, I, I think it was one or two weeks, I think it was two weeks ago, I really covered the whole reprobate thing. But they really do represent perfectly a reprobate nation when they get taken away. And, and verse 16 here just shows you again, it says, you know, when, when God has compassion, when God's sending people out, he's sending preachers to preach to them, to love them, to tell them the truth. What do they do? But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. And when someone goes reprobate, there's no remedy. There's no fixing it. They're rejected. They're done. They're cut off. It's done. And that's where Judah pushed it to that point. His own people pushed it to the point. He says, I'm sending messengers. I love you. Hear my message. Hear my words. Hear it from me. They mock. They despise. They mistreat the prophet. They, they beat him up. I mean, Jeremiah was thrown into a prison. He almost died because they lowered him down. He was just in this sludge just in this waste and, 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 and you know, they're giving him like barely enough food to be able to survive. Thankfully, he didn't get diseased and die. I mean, God was looking out for him and, and all the other prophets, you know, some of them, they just don't read Hebrews 11. Tell, it talks about how they misused the prophets in many cases and the people had great faith until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people and there was no remedy. This is going to happen again too, by the way. There's going to be messengers of God in the end times here they're going to be doing great exploits. They're going to love the people. They're going to try to be entreating through God's compassion on a wicked, sinful world, trying to say, hey, get right with God. Hey, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, believe God. He wants you to be saved. And people are going to mock. And iniquity is going to abound because the love of many wax is cold. And people are going to be mocked. The, the preachers of righteousness are going to be mocked. They're going to be ridiculed. Be ready for it. If this happens in our lifetime, be ready to be mocked and ridiculed and evilly entreated as they, they scourge people and arrest them and, and you know, do whatever, ultimately trying to kill them. We're not taking the mark of the beast. But thank God, God's going to come back and settle the score and make things right. And, and when, when God comes to save us, that's when he pours out his wrath. And guess what? At that point, there's no remedy for the people. That's right. That wrath is coming and it's not going to stop until God's done. Right. He, there, there is, they, 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 at that point, they'll have pushed it too far and it just has to happen. Just like they got to this point. I mean, for so long, they could have changed course a little bit. They could have gotten it a little bit easier. They could have received mercy if they would have just humbled themselves and obeyed the word of the Lord. But nope, they didn't do it. So they push it to a point where there's no remedy. There's no, no fixing it. Look at verse number 17 here in 2 Chronicles 36. Therefore he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees. So for this reason, this is why he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees, who slew their young men with the sword, in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion. That's not, that's not a coincidence that it uses that since you know, God had compassion on his people, he sent a king then after they mocked him that had no compassion on them. God was already giving them compassion. They didn't want it. So now a king's going to come along that has no compassion and it, it's really bad. Upon young man or maiden, old man or him that stooped for age, he gave them all into his hand. He's going, killing, whatever. Doesn't matter, women, children, just, he's going he's gonna to deal with them with no compassion. And all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king and of his princes, all these he brought to Babylon. And they burnt the house of God and break down the wall of Jerusalem and burnt all the palaces thereof with fire and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. And them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years. So that's the 70 years that Jeremiah prophesied that because the children of Israel never kept Sabbath. They were supposed to keep a Sabbath year 
and they were supposed to not work the land. They were supposed to leave it go. They were supposed to work the land for six years, and then that seventh year was supposed to be a Sabbath of rest for the land. And basically, since God instituted that, they never listened to that. They never listened to the word of the Lord. They never had faith. They never trusted, or they just cared about the money too much. They cared about, you know, they, they couldn't trust in God that what God actually said they could listen to and they'd be just fine. Just like they were fine in the wilderness when God provided manna and he provided double on Friday. So then on the Sabbath day, when he wasn't providing for them, there's nothing out there. He didn't want them going out and working. He made sure they were covered every single time. But they did not do that with their Sabbaths of years. So he says, okay, every year that you've missed, every Sabbath that was missed, you're going into captivity. And that way the land is going to rest. Says, I'm going to make sure one way or the other, if you're not going to do it, I make sure it happens. 70 years, complete rest because everyone was taken away. There was even no one there to work the land. Go back, if you would, to 2 Kings 25. That was a much more detailed description we saw in 2 Chronicles 36 about the, about the destruction of Jerusalem and how much they really tore down. We're going to read a uh, sim, you know, similar passage in, in 2 Kings 25, look at verse number 8. The Bible says, And in the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, which is the nineteenth year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came Nebuchadnezzar Adan, captain of the guard, a servant of the king of Babylon under Jerusalem, and he burnt the house of the Lord and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem, and every great man's house burnt he with fire. And all the army of the Chaldees that were with the captains of the guard break down the walls of Jerusalem round about. And this is, this is exactly what happens when you don't repent after the first punishment. And we can take that to heart too. You know, when maybe you get into sin, you start doing something wrong, you start turning your neck, you know, hardening your neck or your heart towards God's word. And God brings some type of discipline in your life, some type of punishment, things aren't going that well. Take heed to that first punishment. Because the second one's going to be a lot worse. And that's the way in my household. When I tell my kids something, they disobey, and they need, they need the punishment, they need the discipline, they're going to get it. But if they just refuse to listen after that, the next punishment is way worse. And that is totally the way it is with God. I mean, we see a perfect example of that here. They could have had their structures, they could have had the house, they could have had so much, even after they're judged. They could have still had, so, there's still so many things going for them. But they didn't get right. And we need to remember that. Let's get right. When, hey, when things go bad, humble yourself. You know, everyone may at time to time, you know, experience a little bit of rebellion against God. I'm not saying that's right at all, but it happens. But if that does happen, don't, you know, be quick to, to, to soften your heart and soften your neck a little bit. So that you don't have to go through more than, than you ought to. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 11, 2 Kings 25, 11. Now the rest of the people that were left in the city and the fugitives that fell away to the king of Babylon with the remnant of the multitude did Nebuzaradan and the captain of the guard carry away. So this is the final, basically, carrying away almost everybody at this point. The first time they carried people away, it was mostly Jerusalem and, and, you know, and certain people, but not everybody. And now it says in verse 12, it says, but the captain of the guard left of the poor of the land to be vine dressers and husbandmen. Like now it's just whoever is just critical for doing the few things to kind of keep the land from just being completely over, just overgrown and stuff. The vine dressers, husbandmen, okay, they let those people and that's about it. Verse number 13, and the pillars of brass that were in the house of the Lord and the bases and the brazen sea. And it goes on and on. I'm going to skip over most of this uh, just for sake of time. It totally, let's start reading again in verse 19. It, it, just, it just spells out everything we already saw, everything Jeremiah already spelled out that, that in the house of the Lord is being taken. Verse number 19, uh, And out of the city he took an officer that was set over the men of war, and five men of them that were in the king's presence, which were found in the city, and the principal scribe of the host, which mustered the people of the land, and threescore men of the people of the land that were found in the city. And Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, took these and brought them to the king of Babylon, to Riblah. And the king of Babylon smote them and slew them at Riblah in the land of Hamath. So Judah was carried away out of their land. And basically what that's saying is that the, the people who were near the top in charge that were just under the king, people who, who had, who had uh, rule, um, they took all the leaders and just killed them which they already took away most of the leaders in the first captivity. So these are the new leaders being set up.
that rebelled and they killed them too. So um, let's keep reading. Verse number 22. And as for the people that remained in the land of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had left, even over them he made Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, ruler. And when all the captains of the armies, they and their men heard that the king of Babylon had made Gedaliah governor, there came to Gedaliah to Mizpah even Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and Johanan, the son of Korea, and Sariah, the son of Tanhumeth, the Natalpathite, and Jeazaniah, the son of a Maacathite, they and their men. And Gedaliah sware to them and to their men and said unto them, Fear not to be the servants of the Chaldees. Dwell in the land and serve the king of Babylon, and it shall be well with you. Same message Jeremiah was given. Gedaliah is a, the man who's, who's put in charge for a reason, obviously, by Babylon, but still telling them the right thing to do. Verse 25, But it came to pass in the seventh month that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, the son of Elishma, of the seed royal, and notice that it says he's of the seed royal. So he has, he's thinking he's got a claim to, to be king, even though they're not under their own rule anymore. They're under the rule of the king of Babylon. And Babylon, you know, the king of Babylon set up Gedaliah. So he comes, as he came with ten men with him and smote Gedaliah that he died, and the Jews and the Chaldees that were with him at Mizpah. So he didn't just kill Gedaliah, but he also killed other people. He killed some of the Chaldeans that were there helping to run things. And just, again, the rebellion just starts right over again with, um, with Ishmael. And um, turn, if you would, now to Jeremiah. We're almost done. We're going to look at some, some more Jeremiah. 2 Kings 25 is almost done. Jeremiah 41. We see a little bit more detail on events that happen at this, at this time in history. Jeremiah 41, verse number 17, the Bible says, And they departed and dwelt in the, land, in the habitation of Chimham, which is by Bethlehem, to go to enter into Egypt. And uh, because of the Chaldeans, for they were afraid of them, because Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, had slain Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, whom the king of Babylon made governor in the land. So now their plan is, so basically what, what happened is, and I, and I didn't go through all the details, read through Jeremiah, and especially after having gone through all these series, it, it really sheds a lot more light and understanding on the things that he's talking about because they happen simultaneously with all these events. But um, Ishmael kills Gedaliah and some other people, and he, and he does a lot more. There's a lot more stories about Ishmael and things that he does. But ultimately, he ends up being killed then. And um, Johanan basically kills him and takes over. And this is where we're jumping into Jeremiah 41. So now the people are worried. Even though Ishmael's dead and he was the troublemaker, they're still worried about Babylon because they killed the ruler that Babylon put in charge and they killed some Chaldeans. And now it's like, they just came and destroyed everything. What are they going to do now? So they were fearful. They were scared. What are we going to do? And they were getting ready to go into Egypt, right? Which is always a bad move. Yeah. Egypt is not who they need to be relying on for their strength. But what they do, we're going to see in Jeremiah 42. We start in 41 just to get the context of chapter 42. They do go to Jeremiah. And they say, okay, we're ready to listen to God now. Right? We're ready to listen to God except when God says something that we don't want him to say. Right. And this is like the vast majority of people. I'll listen to God when he tells me what I want to hear. You know, people having itching ears that want to go to the, to the false prophets, to the Joel Osteen, so they can tickle their ear and tickle their belly and make them feel all good inside. And yeah, that's the God that I want to serve and just make up their own God. Because he's telling me what I want to hear. And you know what? Watch out. If you say something a little bit too harsh, I might have to leave. Why? Because they're not interested in the truth. They're not interested in God and who God is. They're just interested in hearing what they want to hear and justifying themselves. And this is exactly the attitude that these people had when they said, okay, Jeremiah, we'll do whatever it is. Hey, whatever it is, we're going to read it in Jeremiah 42. Whatever it is God has for us to do, we'll do it. Let's see what they say. Verse, uh, verse number one, chapter 42 there in Jeremiah. 
Then all the captains of the forces and Johanan, the son of Korea, and Jezaniah, the son of Hoshiah, and all the people from the least, even unto the greatest, came near and said unto Jeremiah the prophet, Let we beseech thee our supplication be accepted before thee. And pray for us unto the Lord thy God, even for all this remnant, for we are left but a few of many, as thine eyes do behold us, that the Lord thy God may show us the way wherein we may walk and the thing that we may do. So they say, we want you to show us what's God wants to do. And look, Jeremiah was preaching very publicly. He was preaching to the king. He was preaching to the people. He did not hide this message at all. He was hated by many because he was so vocal with preaching the word of the Lord. They knew that Jeremiah prophesied everything that had already happened now to this point. They knew it all. They knew that he was a prophet of the Lord. So they come to him and they should go to him. They should recognize, hey, this is actually, he knows what he's talking about because everything that he prophesied has come to pass. I got an idea. Let's listen to that guy. So they're like, just tell us what is God, whatever way God wants us to walk, whatever way that is, we'll listen to him. Let's see what Jeremiah answered him. Verse number four. Then Jeremiah the prophet said unto them, I have heard you. Behold, I will pray unto the Lord your God according to your words, and it shall come to pass that whatsoever thing the Lord shall answer you, I will declare it unto you. I will keep nothing back from you. Thank God you got someone like Jeremiah that's not going to hold anything back. There's way too many people today that are worried about offending somebody. Well, this is what God said, but you know what? That's kind of ours. I'm going to say it a little bit differently. No. No, don't go censoring God's word. Yeah, right. Jeremiah wouldn't censor God's word. He said, fine. You want to know what God has to say? I'll go pray to him for you. And whatever he says, I'm going to tell you exactly what he says. He's a man of integrity. Praise God. Verse number five, then they said to Jeremiah, the Lord be a true and faithful witness between us. If we do not even according to all things for the which the Lord thy God shall send thee to us. Those are some pretty strong words. Whether it be good or whether it be evil, we will obey the voice of the Lord our God to whom we send thee, that it may be well with us when we obey the voice of the Lord our God. Look at what they've been through. Now, you would think, of course, that, how could you not have this attitude after suffering and being besieged? And they've been besieged twice, mind you, at this point. They've suffered two famines and the pestilences and the, 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 the killings and the conquerings, all of this stuff, and now they're facing it again. You think it's time to get right with God and just to say, well, whatever it is, I'll just do it. Because we obviously haven't been doing things right to this point. So they say that, but this shows you where the heart of this people truly is. I mean, I would hope that at least for us in this room, if God were to have to bring you so low and you have to go through all those things, that you still wouldn't be hard-hearted when it comes to serving the Lord. But why were they any different than anyone else? Watch out. Take heed, watch out for, these, for this attitude. Look at verse number seven. And it came to pass after 10 days that the word of the Lord came into Jeremiah. Then called he Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the captains of the forces which were with him, and all the people from the least, even the greatest, and said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, unto whom ye sent me to present your supplication before him. If ye will still abide in this land, then will I build you and not pull you down and I will plant you and not pluck you up. For I repent me of the evil that I have done unto you. Now, look, first of all, just right off the bat, is he saying anything that bad? Just stay where you're at. This is, stay in your own land. Build here, plant here. He said, you know what? I'm actually kind of repenting a little bit for how much evil I brought against you. This isn't sounding like that bad rough of a message to these people. Let's keep reading. Verse number 11. Be not afraid of the king of Babylon of whom ye are afraid. Be not afraid of him, saith the Lord. For I am with you to save you and to deliver you from his hand. Even after all of that, God's still willing to say, hey, you know what? I'm still there and I'll protect you. 
I'll deliver you. Just trust in me. If I tell you that I'll protect you, believe me. That's what he wanted the whole time. It was their faith. He wanted their attention, their affection, and he wasn't getting it. And even after all of this, you could say, I mean, how can God be so merciful as just to say, you know what, just stay here. I'll bless you again. You can build, you can plant, and I'll protect you. Don't worry about the king of Babylon. I know he, what, everything he's done to you, but I'll protect you from him. Verse 12, and I will show mercies unto you that ye may have mercy upon you and cause you to return to your own land. But if ye say, we will not dwell in this land, neither obey the voice of the Lord your God, saying, no, but we will go into the land of Egypt, where we shall see no war, nor hear the sound of the trumpet, nor have hunger of bread, and there will we dwell. And now therefore hear the word of the Lord, ye remnant of Judah. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, if ye wholly set your faces to enter into Egypt, and to go to sojourn there, then it shall come to pass that the sword, which ye feared, shall overtake you there in the land of Egypt, and the famine, whereof ye were afraid, shall follow close after you there in Egypt, and there ye shall die. He said, all the things that you're afraid of, if you just believe in me, if you just do what I'm telling you to do, you don't have to be afraid of those things. But if you do the opposite, if you go and do this other, if you just go and head into Egypt and try to do things your way and use man's wisdom and say, oh, we're going to go and be safe in Egypt, then everything that you feared would have happened to you if you would have just stayed here, it's all going to come on you over there. And be sure about that. And what do the gluttons for punishment do? Verse 17, he, well, he keeps on going here. So shall it be with all men that set their faces to go into Egypt to sojourn there. They shall die by the sword, by the famine, by the pestilence, and none of them shall remain or escape from the evil that I will bring upon them. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, as mine anger and my fury have been poured forth upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so shall my fury be poured forth upon you when ye shall enter into Egypt. And ye shall be an execration and an astonishment and a curse and a reproach. And ye shall see this place no more. The Lord hath said concerning you, O ye remnant of Judah, go ye not into Egypt. Know certainly that I have admonished you this day. For ye dissembled in your hearts when ye sent me unto the Lord your God, saying, pray for us unto the Lord our God and according unto all that the Lord our God shall say, so declare unto us and we will do it. Jeremiah is already saying, you dissembled in your hearts. You were faking it. You're already turning back in your hearts as you were saying, well, whatever he says, we'll do. Verse 21, and now I have heard, and now I have this day declared it to you, but ye have not obeyed the voice of the Lord your God, nor anything for the which he hath sent me unto you. Now therefore know certainly that ye shall die by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence in the place whither ye desire to go in a sojourn. And in chapter 43, we see their answer to him. Verse number two in chapter 43, Then spake Azariah the son of Hoshai, and Johanan the son of Korea, and all the proud men. Notice, they're proud, because they don't want to humble themselves and submit to the Lord. Saying unto Jeremiah, Thou speakest falsely, the Lord our God hath not sent thee to say, Go not into Egypt to sojourn. Yeah, they already knew in their minds, Whatever God said we're going to do, as long as it's going to Egypt, because that's what we want to do. You lie. He didn't say not to go into Egypt. We'll do anything he says. Oh, no, he didn't say that. Verse 3, But Barak the son of Neriah said it the on against us for to deliver us into the hand of the Chaldeans that they might put us to death and carry us away captives into Babylon. So Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the captains of the forces and all the people obeyed not the voice of the Lord to dwell in the land of Judah. And notice just the, the Ill, illogical conclusions of how people who are really lifted up with pride can be. They're not thinking straight at all. If they just, just would take a step back and just try to rationally look at who Jeremiah is and what has he been saying this whole time and everything that he said that they were supposed to do when they didn't do it, Really bad things came and happened. So if they could just humble, you know, again, and the problem is their pride. Pride blinds you. When you're so lifted up with yourself and you think you know everything that's right and no one else can tell you any different, the truth just goes by the wayside. And even be able to think about what's right doesn't seem to matter. 
They could have looked at Jeremiah and said, this is right. We should just trust him because he's been right every other time. Let's just believe him now and do what he says and actually do what the Lord says. But they couldn't do that. And destruction came. 2 Kings 25, we'll finish off the chapter, verse number 27. And it came to pass in the seven and thirtieth year of the captivity of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in the twelfth month, on the seven and twentieth day of the month, that evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the year that he began to reign, did lift up the head of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, out of prison. So this is Jehoiakim. He was, the, he was the, the king that was set up right after Jehoiakim. And he was the one who only reigned for three months. He reigned for three months and he gave up. And he was carried away captive. And then they, you know, Zedekiah was set up. And that's when we got into all 2 Kings 25. But now when evil Merodach begins to reign, he lifts him up out of prison. Yet for whatever reason, he likes Jehoiakim. And he takes him out of prison. And he says, he spake kindly to him and set his throne above the throne of the kings that were with him in Babylon and changed his prison garments. And he did eat bread continually before him all the days of his life. And his allowance was a continual allowance given him of the king, a daily rate for every day, all the days of his life. And it's a little interesting because it almost appears like it's kind of setting up, which it doesn't happen until the reign of the Persians. So, um, during the Babylonian Empire, the entire time, the children of Judah and Israel are captive and they don't get back into their land. And it's not until um, Cyrus, the king of Persia, is in charge and, and the, the, the global government changes from Babylon to the Medes and the Persians when the children of Israel are allowed back. But we already start to see, and I don't know exactly where evil Merodach falls in the secession of kings from Nebuchadnezzar on down, but it doesn't really matter. It just, what's interesting to me, it just kind of seems like the attitude towards the Jews is changing a little bit from, you know, from taking him out of prison and kind of putting him at a good place above other kings in the, in the kingdom overall. And um, we see at the end of 2 Chronicles 36 is when it refers to Cyrus and it refers to the children of Israel going back into the land when that happens, when the, when the, the Medes and Persian empire takes over. So that's it for the second King, for the book of second Kings, for first and second Kings. Be here next week. We're going to start a brand new Bible study. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all the great truths and in, in, in these stories and in this great history, dear Lord. We pray that you would please help us to just understand the Bible that much more. Help us to not be stiff-necked or hard-hearted, dear Lord, and that if we have to receive chastening, that we can just receive the actual correction and not get sucked into doing the same thing over and over again and just bring a, a worse punishment upon ourselves. Lord, help us to, to not be lifted up with pride, but we can stay humble and, and learn from these examples of, of these people, dear Lord. And we know that these things were written for our admonition and we could understand and not fall into the same traps. Dear God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.